Hi. Yes, so in this panel, we are going to talk about the science drivers. And so the format will be that we will each take up the order of eight minutes, so that would leave about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. I ask everyone on the panel to be kind of provo provocative. So let me start with kind of the drivers of science on petascale. And when we look at the New York Times, almost every week there is a picture like this about the data deluge. And what is interesting here is that this is in the business section. So there are several messages in this picture. It's not in the science section. And the other is that look at the targeted ad on the top. So whoever is reading this article, so we want you, says the government. Okay, so my background is in astronomy, and I spent about 25 years of my life working on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was creating a very large homogeneous data set of the sky, which we made all public to begin with. But, and it had a 2.4 meter telescope, but a 120 megapixel camera, which was by far the largest camera in the world at the time. But soon it was superseded about 10 years ago by PenStars, which was crossing over to the billion pixel limit. And now the flagship project is emerging is the large scale synoptic survey telescope, the LSST, which in the end will be probably close to a billion dollars, but it has three billion pixels. And what is driving actually all this data deluge in astronomy? And it is clear, so this is a picture we created with Tony Tyson many years ago. And basically the blue line is the glass area of the world's largest telescopes. And you can see that it's going really slowly. But then the red is the CCD galaxy, the galaxies detected on this CCD mosaics. And then the Black dot is the CCD pixels on these mosaics. And then there is actually the number of transistors on, on a CPU is the yellow. So you can see that this is entirely div driven by semiconductor technology. That is the driver. And the data in astronomy is roughly doubling every year. And this is generally true in much of science. And this is causing substantial sociological changes in science. These, so these are the drivers why we are here today. And so what we see is, first of all, is that we see a major convergence between physical and life sciences. So physicists and astronomers are now facing the same sort of data challenges that people in genomics or systems biology. So we have to deal with massive amounts of data. The other pattern that is emerging that the data collection is happening in ever larger collaboration, like, you know, and every physical scale. So the CERN, the BAO, the Human Genome Project, OOI, NEON, and so on. And, but what we see is that the analysis is becoming increasingly decoupled. So if we put this data out in an open data set for the public, then individuals or so, small groups can come in and analyze this data. But sometimes as the data sets are growing into many petabytes, individuals will have to have the ability to actually get access to these data sets and to be able to actually do computations on top. What we also see is the emergence of even the citizen and internet scientists, so we are not only have to serve our immediate scientific domains, but actually a much broader audience beyond this. So like in the, there are about 15,000 astronomers in the world, but on the Sloan survey, we see about 4 million IP addresses among the people who have run SQL queries on the website, which is a really remarkable number. And you know, the mantra has been that in this world, we have to take the analysis to the data. But this doesn't mean that we are not faced every day with the tasks of moving petabytes of data. And when you look at Google, et cetera, and who have the largest data collections in the world, they are still constantly moving data from one data center to another for load balancing, partly also for fault, fault tolerance and so on. And the same thing is happening in science. Or for example, LSST will generate 60 petabytes of data in Chile. We have to get this to the continental US and then we have to get it down to the universities. But the, not just the big instruments are generating huge amounts of data, but what we increasingly see that the large HPC computers are also becoming major instruments in their own right. 
So the largest simulations from supernovae to turbulence and brain modeling, these simulations are becoming petabytes and soon they will be even much larger. And if we only do in situ analysis while the code is running, it's not good enough because the broader scientific community, now we have that, the appetite of the science community. They, they want to have access to these data sets and they want to play with them. It's, which means also we have to move them from the supercomputers where they are kind of in the expensive fast storage. We have to build actually some secondary data resources out of this where they can do interactive analysis of these petabytes. So this, I call this numerical laboratories. And one example is a recent NSF grant that we just got to build a two petabyte ocean circulation library model where people can come in from the public and run this, run basically their analysis on the data. It's a one kilometer resolution model which has about two petabytes of data. And you can see that scaling the current simulations which are all the blue dots, we are the red cross. There. So a substantial increase in the, both in the resolution, more than an order of magnitude in resolution and roughly three orders of magnitude in data size. So these are the types of challenges. But as we move towards the extra scale, things will get even more challenging. Because when you look at just at the top of the pyramid, how much of the, is the memory in Trinity? It's three petabytes. Okay, so every single, if there is a, Simulation that runs over the whole machine, a single snapshot, a single checkpoint restart will be three petabytes. So we can't do the normal if we did a, you, you know, 100 checkpoints, 100 snapshots, that's already 300 petabytes. So we are looking at something interesting and it's not clear what will go. So this brings up the question that how do we prioritize? And so science is becoming increasingly data driven, but it is becoming in a way too easy. So this is one of my provocative slides. It's becoming too easy to collect data. And we are right now getting comfortable in grabbing a petabyte or so, but soon we will be faced in grabbing exabytes if we keep continuing what we are doing. And we are running out of money, essentially. So how long can this go on? And if I ask any one of my science colleagues that do you have enough data or would you like to have more, I haven't met a person who would say I don't want any more data. But it's, an Ill, but it's a wrong answer to an ill post question. Because what they really meant to say is that I want more good data that gives me more science. They don't want more garbage that they have to sort out. And so here is the thing, that big data is becoming increasingly synonymous with noisy and dirty data. In science, this means systematic errors that we need to get rid of. And how can we actually decide how to collect data that is more relevant? This is what scientists want, and this is what we can learn from the LHC. So I had the privilege, you know, working with people like Harvey on, who have been doing LHC, and I was watching over the decades how they have Work, been working on this very, very hard trade-offs. And in the end, at the detector, they have an incredible data stream coming of the detectors, and they throw away essentially almost all the data. They only keep one out of every 10 million events, but it is selected very carefully to keep essentially most, to so, throw away the least of the new science or potential science that can come. This is the lesson we have to learn in other areas of science. So summarizing, so science is increasingly driven by data. And once we hit petabytes, it used to be, you know, terabytes a few years ago, but now we are really hitting petabyte data sets. It, it requires a different approach. We can't do the brute force any longer easily. We need really new instruments. We don't have to, we shouldn't think about this as computational systems. We need a microscope and a telescope for data where we can both dig into the details, but we can see the big picture simultaneously. We see the changing sociology in science due to data. And we have to prepare for the hard trade-offs. We cannot, simply cannot store everything, period. And we have to think about not about how to store, but how to analyze the data. Everything should be driven by this question. And what we see is this new force paradigm of science emerging that, you know, it was promoted by Jim. And adding to that the exascale, on exascale, everything is a big data problem. So let me hand it off to Chris. Thank you.
Okay, I'm Chris Paley from San Diego State University. I'm in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. And what I'll talk about today is, uh, first I'll talk about some future possible P NRP focus areas that we can concentrate on. The first one is, I think we should inter, you know, work on introducing accelerated computing into our research. So this is looking at areas of numerical codes and seeing how we can accelerate them with first FPGAs. Uh, right now we're looking at the Xilinx Vertex Ultrascale board, but also with GPUs like the V100 and now TPUs. So one thing we can focus on is how to build Kubernetes nodes with FPGA device access. Another thing that we might want to look at is how to do distributed parallel rendering of very large data sets. So when we run numerical codes, say on the Kubernetes, we produce terabyte sized files. And these are two large files to download, to visualize locally on your workstation. So how can we use things, tools like Paraview with their client server architecture and use MPI to render in parallel uh, subsets of a very large data file? Another thing is we, how to integrate these large parallel storage clusters into the, into the P or NRP network. Um, SDSU just was awarded a CC star storage award. We have a 2.4 petabyte parallel storage cluster that runs VGFS. So this is, these are good technologies where you have computation that's I.O. bound, where the, the wall time is not governed by the, how fast your CPUs are, how much memory you have, but how fast you can read and write data. And so we use APIs like MPI.io, I use parallel net CDF, HDF5. So how can we integrate those parallel storage systems into the P or NRP network? And then finally, uh, embedded machine learning, embedded object detection and deep learning on microcontrollers and FPGAs. Uh, how can we extend the PNRP network to include IoT? You know, these are distributed sensors or wearable devices using lo you know, low power networks like the lower physical layer. So just to give you a brief example of, of how, why we need accelerated computing, um, for example, in one of the codes uh, I work on, I have to continually compute at every grid point how much water evaporates into a CO2 gas phase and how much CO2 gas is dissolved into water. And to do that computation, you have to solve a, a computationally intensive integral for a molar volume fraction. So this integral, uh, you have to integrate this, compu this computationally complex um, integrand, and it requires uh, derivatives of the Born model, of a Born function. So how can we take those, those computationally complex or time-consuming pieces and move them into an FPGA or a GPU? So one of the science drivers that I'm involved in where I use the PRP was modeling CO2 sequestration and wastewater injection. So we've modeled, for example, a model based on the Frio Foundation, the Frio Formation, which is in uh, near Houston, Texas. It's a reservoir that has three sandstone layers that are separated by two shale layers. So we, we modeled this using different uh, grid resolutions, we vary the grid resolution in the, along the z-plane to look at interaction between the sandstone and the shale. So for, here's just a brief script from my talk yesterday on how you can run a distributed parallel computation on the PRP network. Here's an example script uh, that I'll provide to you in a Git repository on how you can run uh, MPI-based jobs on Comet or the PRP network. So for example, um, I can show you a brief simulation. So this is a simulation, and this is a Paraview animation, but the results were computed on, on the PRP network. This is just a simulation of CO2 injection. You're looking at the molar concentration of CO2 as you're injecting it into that sandstone shale formation modeled after the Frio formation. So this is the mineralogical composition of the shale which serves as a cap rock 
that prevents CO2 transport back into upper layers and not and not in the atmosphere. We want to prevent that. Is the composition of sandstone? Yes. Oh, sorry. Move this over here. So another research project I'm involved in using the PRP is the synergistic carbon capture and sequestration enhanced ore recovery and biofuel generation project. And one of the components is, can we validate through numerical simulation if we can speed up the rate that CO2 is sequestered and turned into solid phase carbonate mineral through numerical validation? So these are simulations I've been running on the PRP network. So I can just show you a brief example of these are results obtained uh, on Comet using the PRP infrastructure. So this just shows how after you inject a CO2 gas into the subsurface and then follow that injection with a highly alkaline, highly hard wastewater, hardness means the amount of calcium and magnesium ions in the water, you can speed up the rate of carbonate mineralization, which is ideal because it reduces the risk of injected CO2 being re-released into the atmosphere because you're storing that carbon in mineral form and solid phase. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that SDSU is the recipient of the CC Storage Award. So this allowed us to acquire this 2.4 petabyte storage cluster you see here. And this, this is running the BGFS parallel file system. So this allows us to speed up our IO bound computations. So for example, we do work in coastal ocean modeling, um, sequestration, which I've talked about. We also do turbulent combustion modeling. And another very interesting project we, we do is we do real time CO2 and methane data acquisition. We have uh, these sensors placed along the north slope of Alaska, and these are continuously acquiring CO2 and CH4 flux measurements, and then transmitting those over our 100 gig uh, PRP supported network, and it's stored on this BGFS cluster in real time. So we're, we're acquiring data that's transported into our science DMZ and stored on this large uh, storage cluster. So this is a, a system where if you have, if you're constrained on read-write timing operations, this is an ideal file system to use. Now, um, one of the projects I just started working on now where we're using a GPU cluster that was supported by the CI Chase project, which was just mentioned, um, is this pro project where we're predicting um, and determining if an elderly person has fallen. So we're developing a, a wearable wireless sensor that predicts the likelihood that someone's going to fall, and then of course detecting when a fall occurs. And we're, we're using these Noraxon sensors. So we have a VR lab where we have students with a VR headset walk, and they're walking along on a carpet, and unbeknownst to them, we yank the carpet and they fall down. And then, so st students love this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't ask me about IRB. Uh, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and we've, what we, have, we have the students wear about 100 different sensors placed all over their body. And these sensors have a accelerometer and it has a motion tracking device. And then we take all of the angular uh, positional data and, we, and the acceleration data, and then we calculate some derived features, um, jerk and snap, which are third and fourth derivatives of position. And then we try to, and then we use um, different machine learning methods to classify uh, and predict whether someone has fallen or not. So for example, this is some recent data. This picture over here is, um, this is a skeleton, you can see the skeleton, and this is, um, um, this, the, uh, you read in the data that we've captured and the skeleton moves like the person moved when they fell. And so we, we have, there's like 130 different features plus derived features from third and fourth derivatives of every uh, sensor. And then, so we've used um, recurrent neural networks with 
a long short-term memory to do some training, and we have these accuracies uh, from our training and test data. So that, that's, that's done using the CI, CI Chase uh, GPU cluster where we did this training. And uh, we're also looking at uh, boosted trees, random forests, to see if we can get uh, better accuracy in our classification. So we're using uh, XGBoost, which is a gradient boosting um, uh, a tool that's open source. And so, for example, if we use a random forest or, or gradient boosted decision trees using XGBoost, we can get pretty good um, accuracy in our training and testing. So right now we, we want to embed that into, we're looking at these ARM um, development, these nucleo boards for embedding um, neural networks or uh, um, and object detection algorithms on these ARM boards so that we can turn these into a wearable sensor. And then of course we have another project where we want to show the prediction um, ahead of time, and so a great project we have students working on, undergraduate students, is they're using the AR core to, to use augmented reality on the smartphone to notify someone if they're about to fall down. So it's an interesting way to use augmented reality um, in addition to mach a machine learning, an embedded machine learning project. So these are, these are some of the science drivers I've been involved in. Any questions? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Xiaofen Dong from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to highlight uh, some of the amazing science uh, our researchers has, have been doing at, uh, at UC Santa Cruz. So as, as you uh, probably all know that uh, last year's top science discovery was uh, the detection of the neutron star uh, collision by the uh, by the gravitational waves observatory such as uh, LIGO in US and uh, Super Virgo in Italy. But what you might not know that uh, uh, it, was a, it was a team uh, at UC Santa Cruz led by Professor uh, Ryan Foley who first spotted the, uh, the optical counterpart of the collision only 11 hours after the gravitational synchros. Actually, that, that finding actually kicked off an astronomical free for all. So basically, after that, basically all, every single telescope in the world pointed to the, to the same direction. And uh, they captured uh, visible infrared, ultraviolet, uh, followed by x-rays and uh, radio waves. That's, that's actually uh, marked a new era uh, in astronomy, the era, uh, the era of multi-messenger astronomies. That's what, that was a major finding. And uh, uh, some of the uh, th theoretical astrophysics uh, in UC Santa Cruz uh, use supercomputers to simulate the physics of extreme events such as uh, supernovae and the neutron star mergers, right? And the mergers of two neutron stars like this drives the synthesis of heavy elements such as gold and platinum. That's how we have all the gold in the universe. They calculate that neutron star mergers can account for about half of all the uh, elements heavier than irons in the universe, right? So UCLC uh, has always been a leading center in astronomy, both in terms of uh, observational astronomy and uh, theoretical astronomy. Uh, we have always been uh, very strong in using uh, national supercomputers uh, to simulate the universe. Uh, this is just one example. Uh, one of our postdocs actually won the uh, very prestigious uh, NERSC HPC Achievement Awards uh, in, uh, in 2015, and uh, Larry actually shows uh, one of his uh, 
most spectacular uh, visualization. This is about the uh, the death of a really, really supermassive star, uh, uh, 50,000 uh, times the mass of our sun. That's truly amazing. Uh, you probably uh, know that uh, uh, UCSA is also a, uh, a leading center for uh, cosmology, and uh, uh, the the standard cosmology model, the Namta CDM, with both dark matter and dark energy war, actually invented at UCLC by uh, by Sandy Faber, uh, George Blumenzo, uh, Joe Primack at UC Santa Cruz, and uh, Sir Martin Rees, who were visiting from uh, Cambridge, UK at that time. Uh, uh, researchers at UC Santa Cruz have done many, many uh, large, massive scale uh, simulations uh, for galaxies and for universe. They have done many, many big, uh, many, many big simulations using uh, using big supercomputers uh, from the local level to national level, even to the international level. They have done many, many big uh, simulations. Uh, one of their very ambitious project is called Ang uh, Agora, in which they compare all the big simulations for galaxies and the universe. And they found that uh, despite all those different different calls and different methods, they found a great, uh, amazing agreements of among all those simulations. And recently, uh, uh, our researchers have been moving really big into, into machine learning and artificial intelligence. One of the, uh, one of, uh, their research actually caught a lot of attention, uh, a lot of publicity and media attention. Uh, that's called, uh, face recognition for galaxies. They actually use artificial intelligence. So essentially they use a, they use a standard, uh, computer vision model, uh, uh, convolution neural network model to, uh, to, to train, to, to train a classification scheme. But instead of using, instead of using real pictures, they're using their, uh, simulated, simulated images from their big simulations. Uh, and they found that using this model, they were able to, they were able to classify the images observed from, from Hubble Space, uh, Space Telescope with re re remarkable precision. Remarkable accuracy. So this is really amazing work. And my time is really short, so I'd like to also highlight another another uh, stellar program at UC Santa Cruz, uh, which is our uh, genomics uh, genomics research, uh, which is also a leading center uh, in the world. Uh, as you may or may not know, that actually uh, actually UCSC was the place that. Uh, that first sequence human genomes uh, in uh, in the world ever uh, in uh, in the year of 2000, uh, led by led by two uh, computer scientists actually, uh, Jim Kent and David Hoster. Right. This is then they they told the they, uh, they they assembled the first uh, human genome sequence and made it freely available to the public. This is a truly triumph of open science. And, uh, and open source as well. Uh, without them, without them, right, all our genes would have been patented and owned by some private company and some rogue scientists, right? That would be a disaster for the science. Uh, so this is, this is a, uh, this is a typical, uh, workflow for, uh, for genomics data protection according to Wikipedia. Uh, you go through the samples, uh, sample pr uh, prep, data collection on instrument, then you do storage and processing, and then you do data analysis and sharing. And this, Genomics is, is a truly another uh, big data field in science, but uh, the cost of sequencing actually dropped dramatically over the uh, last 10 years. Uh, in fact, the, the, the drop actually far exceeded Moore's law, right, which is already made then. This, this actually, uh, this actually putting enormous pressure on, on IT systems. So nowadays, they, uh, unlike the old days, uh, people do, uh, genome sequencing on-prem using local, uh, HPC clusters. But given, given the advent of the big data, right, now it's actually make much more sense, right? Make, make, uh, make much, much more sense to use cloud and Docker to do, to do the, uh, to do the sequence because the data set are too large to move. And it's much, much better to, to bring the algorithms, algorithms to the data rather than move your data to, to prime. Uh, so 
that's pretty much it. I'll answer your questions. All right, well, so as, as is so often the case, uh, if I really, really hurry and condense this down, we'll get through the opening remarks before the end of the panel time slot. Um, but I'll have to go fast. So I'm Dan Stanzione, and I am the director at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, Manish made an announcement on our behalf just a little while ago that uh, I didn't think would make it onto a slide. Um, so let me say, yes, we have a new system coming, and uh, let me also point out that the words Manish put on the slide is every single word I am currently authorized to say um, about that particular project was covered in that slide, um, hence the, the dearth of comments perhaps in media about it um, at this point as we uh, move towards signing the cooperative agreements, which include fascinating terms about how often you're reviewed, how many reports you have to write, and all the things Manish can do to me if we do anything wrong. So, um, so we're at that phase of the negotiations and more coming on that. Um, so I won't talk about that today or tomorrow. Um, but, you know, there, there's receptions later. See what you can find out. So, um, <laughs> you know how that works. So, um, but I do want to think about a little bit of the workload we have on the systems we have. When we talk about science drivers, um, we have been running a pretty broad um, set of resources. And I'm not really going to get into what's going on at TAC. Um, but just to say, if we think about what we have, it ranges from... Um, I think at least five of the systems have been mentioned in talks already, and Manish mentioned our big OAC systems like Stampede, um, the data intensive one, Wrangler, the cloud system Jetstream that we partner with Indiana on. Um, Larry mentioned Catapult, the FPGA system with Microsoft. Um, Kate later will talk about Chameleon, our cloud test bed that Larry also mentioned in conjunction with Chicago. So we see all sorts of different um, science models across lots of different users. We see about 15 terabytes a day of data that comes in externally through the network um, today. Uh, that's before we start our 50 petabyte archive move that's coming soon. Um, you might want to do the math on that with 100 gig and figure out how much time we have to get that done. Um, speaking of hard drives and airplanes, um, so we're adding about 10 or 15 terabytes a day to the uh, our archive as it is. Um, and as Manish mentioned, what we see is a a sort of rapidly evolving user model. Um, and there's different ways to look at this that'll give you different answers. Um, but if you look at our sort of traditional simulation users, whatever that means, um, you know, people who SSH in and run big MPI jobs on the system, we have about 10,000 of those, and that's been a fairly static sized community um, over the last couple of years. If you look at people who are coming in to do different things through these different unconventional software stacks, as Manish referred to them, we probably have 50,000 um, users in that category. Um, now, the top 15 of those first 10,000 users use more cycles than the other 40,000 um, in the web portals. We're still 75% plus MPI and cycles count. So again, there's different ways to slice that, but clearly a lot of the growth in science is happening um, in those. And we actually run more portals than systems, and I have more developers than sysadmins, web developers doing API and middleware than sysadmins as a result of that. Um, so when I think about drivers, you know, obviously with the uh, leadership class system that Manish mentioned. We've been thinking a lot about exascale level applications lately. Um, and examples abound of those. I could go through 40 slides of, you know, simulation driven, very large scale examples. But as you go through sort of community by community, and um, we just saw this with multi messenger astronomy, as my colleague described, and we've seen it throughout the, the keynotes this morning, um, much of science today is not just about simulation. And I think the message to take away, given, you know, six minutes or so to talk here, is um, uh, in almost every field we look at, um, there are parts of the scientific workflow, and I use the workflow generally, meaning what people do, I mean, sort of from end to end to a project more than an automated workflow. There are simulation and compute intensive pieces. They're critical pieces, and I don't want to understate those. Um, but it is also not true to say that there are data-driven problems that are completely separate. Because when you do any real problem, you have these simulation and compute-driven pieces um, but you also are going to end up talking to real data at some point to confirm what you do. So you're going to have a data-driven piece of that. Um, 
I've referred to this in talks over the last few years as sort of, particularly in Europe where they use the term e-science, is the new e-science where we're not talking about just large-scale computation. We're talking about a blend of large-scale computation, of long-term stewardship of data, of collection, of curation, of visualization, of analysis, of machine learning. And again, examples abound and I think we'll go through many of them at different times today, so I don't really want to belabor this, but this is one of my favorites. It's with our colleagues in Oklahoma. Um, who both do big ensemble simulations on Stampede around uh, severe storm warning. Um, actually, this is the lab that descended from uh, Kelvin Drogemeyer, who was recently appointed as the new head of OSTP. Um, hooray. Uh, finally one good appointment. Um, that wasn't out loud. Uh, Got to get these two monologues coming out. Um, anyway, but this is uh, severe storms. In particular, the problem in severe storm forecasting recently has been figuring out which ones will produce hail and where and how much, because a lot of the damage comes from hail. Um, and they found we can greatly enhance these predictions if we don't just run ensemble simulations, which tell us a lot about the storm, but we do two other things. One is data assimilation into the model from real-time sensors on the ground as storms progress. Um, uh, and then finally, you take machine learning and you do interpolation between that storm that you're simulating, the forced inversion model you're doing with this to assimilate data, and then mixing that with a database of past simulations through machine learning or past storm tracks. Um, through machine learning, and we can dramatically improve hail forecasting. So um, I'll throw up maybe a couple of more examples and then just get off the stage um, for this. But when we think about these things, I think I went the wrong way there, um, just keep in mind that there are many narrow problems that require intense simulation, and these are all of immense theoretical import, uh, importance, and I don't want to downplay any of these, but when we look at the sort of societal grand challenge problems that we face, um, when you find any sort of applied problem, when we're looking into end, you're going to find some big computation pieces. Um, you're going to find some data pieces. Um, you're going to find lots of human intervention and lots of different ways that we have to compute to do that. So um, I'll hit this again tomorrow, but Manish mentioned the concept of cyber infrastructure ecosystem. Um, and I think that's what it takes at one point. So if there's, you know, one other, only one takeaway is every time you look at one of these problems, think of all the different things that you actually have to compute and all the different data sets. Um, and I hope that one day when we talk about, because every NSF review is, so which science got uniquely done on this system that we're funding and reviewing? Um, and that to any part of the ecosystem, at some point we ought to just answer yes. Um, and also no, because it will be not just the compute systems, but the systems, the networks, the storage, the middleware, the applications, and the people that make these happen, and none of them do it on their own. Um, so just as very brief examples on this. This is a slide that some of you who are at the Stampede site visit as reviewers have seen. Um, I sort of grouped some of our accomplishments from the first year of the big machine we have currently um, into sort of lots of things we did around natural disasters like the hail stuff, but we might have had a $100 billion hurricane um, in Texas last year. Um, basic science around large instruments. LIGO was mentioned, but um, I think I have a slide from maybe Rob from the OSG guys about work we did around the Large Hadron Collider. We've done an, also a huge amount in, in integrating instruments in DARPA's synthetic design, uh, particularly synthetic design and biology program, which involves very large runs and tiny little reactor runs to do data conversion as well. Um, and then you look at our individual science, we had things that were 350,000 core MPI tasks, um, 350,000 MPI tasks, not the recommended method for 350,000 cores, by the way, but we had a user do it in a combustion problem um, down to many containerized apps, right? Um, that were run. And if we just drill down, let me maybe take two of those. Um, if you look at what we did around Hurricane Harvey, right, we had a fleet of simulation problems from people at Penn State, from people at North Carolina, Louisiana, UT Austin, um, running the actual storm models, we had coastal surge models, we had flood models, um, but then we had a huge amount of data from what's in the air, right? As soon as that storm came in, we had planes in the air, we had drones in the air, we had satellite passes um, with live data coming in. In fact, we moved it from the normal Center for Space Research where they do that into our data center just to get the network pipe to JPL where the satellite data was coming in at the speed we needed to move that data because the first responders were also asking, um, so we hear a lot of streets are underwater, um, can you tell us which ones? And of course, they always do lots of lead up and preparation for that by asking us the third day after the storm makes landfall if we can do any of this stuff. Um, so as a follow-up, we actually did an exercise where we used ground-based LIDAR data for elevation maps, GIS building plot data, um, where we took everything for Harvey and some other hypothetical storms and went from the model in the Gulf at a thousand mile scale of running mesoscale models of hurricane um, 
to, at the end, importing this into a GIS system where we could tell for every address in Galveston if your house was flooded above the electrical outlets, which means FEMA has to inspect before you're allowed back in. Um, and we could do it at the single address level. And there was nothing magical about that. It's not exascale. It was not new computation. It's effort and funding and focus. Um, the hurricane modelers had said, we've been trying to do this for 15 years. The first responders said, we've been doing this for 15 years. And my question was, had they ever spoken before? Um, which was an interesting uh, outcome. But anyway, there are huge numbers of these challenges. We could go through data set after data set, and I'm not going to because Alex is standing. Um, but uh, multi-messenger astronomy is a great example. But remember, it's not just data-driven, it's not just simulation, it's all of them. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I'd like to thank for the wonderful uh, short summaries. So let's have a few <laughs> questions. So we don't have that much time, but, but we started a few minutes late, so. So, you know, the first free association that comes to mind is uh, uh, Juliana Freire built this Vistrails service where basically you can take different visualization scripts and uh, different versions and she built a library out of those where you can even trace the provenance of some of those and in that community that has been highly successful. And so I think we need to, to somehow capture this library of best practices and and the other thing that uh, communities like this are probably a very good forum to, to kind of share and uh, kind of disperse the best practices. Uh, this, you know, we, we can't really, we have gone through with the virtual observatory, we spent years on trying to figure out how can we kind of uh, protect the abuses of data so that using data in their own contest. And, and you know, when people do science, as, as you correctly said, I think this is inevitable that some of this is, is going to happen. And the more we share an open forum about this, I think instead of a formal refereeing process, which, which would be too hard for these things, sharing workflows, creating some mechanisms of repositories of workflows where people can, and, and kind of people document their work, that would be the other thing. So may I add a little bit, Alex? So um, that that was a long question, and the short answer, unfortunately, might be no. Um, but uh, um, the uh, and I'm going to steal from my talk tomorrow a little bit. But when we talk about a platform, right, and a national research platform, um, you, you know, one of the questions is how we sort of interface the big centers with the sort of huge distributed community out there, and distributing best practice has got to be one of them, and making sure users understand this. Um, but to beat one other soapbox very briefly. Um, I think we're unique as a discipline where people expect that everything to be made so easy that anyone can use it, right? No one is saying, you know, I wish I could just do my own brain surgery, and why don't we have neuroscience for dummies? Why do I have to go find the specialized neuroscientist um, to open up my head and operate on my brain? Um, shouldn't that be made more user-friendly, right? You just don't hear anyone asking for that, right? Or, you know, lawyers. Um, why don't we have bots that can work without lawyers? Well, okay, so maybe that is a good idea. But for the most part... Um, you know, expertise means having experts in the discipline, and I think there's something to be said for defining what we do in computational science or cyber infrastructure as a discipline, um, and having discipline-specific experts distributed, perhaps networked together through some sort of platform, um, distributed around the country to address those kinds of questions. Although I know an astronomer or astrophysicist who designed his own surgery. So. <laughs> so. I'm not volunteering to beta test that for him. <laughs> this question over there. Well, we're working on it now, so um, we have collected a lot of data. So you mentioned students. We couldn't go to an elderly living facility and ask them to fall down, right? I don't think we'd get approval for that. So we had to choose uh, unwilling guinea pigs, students in our classes, um, giving them extra credit. Um, we've collected a lot of data. I really want to see your IRB forms. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> so just to let you know, they fell on a padded mat. <laughs> Okay. So there were no injuries, and everybody enjoyed it. 
<laughs> Although I got a bloody nose because the VR go I actually did it. The VR goggles, there were the foam, the rubber foam was missing and it dug into my nose. So, but um, we have a lot of data, so we're um, we're we're doing the classification right now, and so we're going to build some prototype models um, on ARM devices. So uh, this is actually this whole project is for a NIH grant that we're going to be submitting in October, and if it gets funded, we'll be able to produce. Um, hundred some prototypes that we'll hopefully get approval for for um, testing at some selected um, elderly homes. So it's something that's being developed right now. We don't we don't only want to detect when someone's fallen. There's also another component that I didn't mention, and that's indoor geolocation. So we we want to detect when someone has fallen, and we want to pinpoint the room they're in and we want to use existing Wi-Fi infrastructure to do it. So there's another project that I didn't go into that, that involves indoor geolocation. It uses Kalman filtering and some other technologies to determine what room someone's in, only using Wi-Fi infrastructure. So it doesn't require the, the Wi-Fi, the, the, the facility to invest in new wireless infrastructure. But these are prototypes that we're going to be making and should be available for testing within the next year. I could just make a quick comment on that. Are you familiar with uh, ACI Ref, the program that's run by um, at, at University of Oklahoma? So I would Google that because they have workshops every summer where you you can actually go as a resident uh, for a week. I went two years ago, and that's a collection of uh, people get together and they talk about. Um, topics like how to communicate cyber infrastructure capabilities to your faculty. So if you go to that group, you'll be able to network with a lot of people involved in cyber infrastructure education and CI support. And um, that's a good way to learn about what re cyber infrastructure resources have, are available. And not only that, you receive training on how to the best ways to communicate how to use cyber infrastructure and high performance computing resources to your faculty who may not be familiar with these types of resources at your at your school. Are you at a CSU university, you said? Okay. So let me add, yeah. that's a great answer, Chris. Um, one other resource um, that we might want to mention, um, you know, so Exceed does a good job of sort of aggregating the resources that are available, but not so much the science stories, but um, the the, place maybe to talk to you from that is a spinoff from Exceed and Dana Brunson sitting there and you should go talk to her, um, who runs one of the people running the Campus Champions program, which now links, what, 500 people across about 200 campuses, um, you know, who are in that role on their campus and they have, what, weekly calls, Dana, bi-weekly, somewhere in there. They have frequent calls where you can get, um, where these sorts of things get discussed a lot, so. Uh, I'd also like that PRP is really, uh, really very friendly community. So check the website also. Uh, you're welcome to join the weekly PRP meetings. So we discuss all sorts of things. So I, I would say we are not in a very good place. Right? If I wanted to transfer a petabyte of data, uh, we would be very far away from the wire speed to transfer. So many of the DTNs are, while they are quite fast, but they then don't have enough storage, so one would have to basically break up the data about to spoonful. Then, so we need much bigger caches. Generally, the, a lot of the edge nodes in many places are misconfigured, so I can typically get kind of 5% of the wire speed if I want to transfer anything on a 100 terabyte scale, which we actually are doing routinely. And many of these new simulations are petabytes, so kind of in, in many ways that's driving us towards the OSN, so to create a texture where we can really transfer petabyte scale data at 100 gigabit speeds in reliable way in a fire and forget fashion. So that's what the deep dive session will be later so today. I, there's a lot of dimensions to that question, um, but I... And Alex touched on, you know, the gap between wire speed and what we actually see is a huge yeah. problem, um, which doesn't necessarily drive to higher wire speeds, right, because people can't exploit them. Um, we have moved to petabyte and fairly regularly. Um, part of that is, you know, one dimension is just minimizing the number of times you moved it. Um, 
you know, we moved the Galaxy archive. The PIs are now at Johns Hopkins with Alex. Um, but it used to be at Penn State. It lives with us now. We copied three petabytes of data down. You know, people run those queries locally, and it's very seldom that we're moving that much data back. Um, where we see the demand for more wire speed is in burst. Our sort of normal day-to-day -day sits at about 20 gigabits um, in and out, almost nonstop. Um, and then there'll be the occasional burst to 80 or 90 gigabits over the 100 gig link. Um, usually expert transfers. And um, last mile is, and protocol are probably the biggest problem, right? People who don't, you know, we have yeah. way too many people who want to move a petabyte over HTTPS instead of something like Globus, perhaps. Um, but we've, you know, we've sustained five terabytes an hour to other campuses, to Indiana, um, other places. So, you know, if we need to move a petabyte, you just set aside 10 days and do it. Um, if you need to move 50, you multiply 10 days by 50, and it's unpleasant. But the, uh, um, but, you know, we've moved a petabyte a bunch of times, but it's when you have to get into a small lab somewhere. It's not the site to site between the bigger sites. It's the last mile um, and the protocol that stand in the way of us getting anywhere near wire speed. Um, and I have rebuffed in various corners of the UT system people who ask for upgrades from 10 gig to 100 gig to 400 gig fairly regularly when saying, you're using 0.01% of the wire speed you have. Why should we invest in more? Mm -hmm. Uh, we, don't, we don't move petabytes, but we regularly move tens of terabytes. Uh, given the uh, knowledge we learned from, from PRP, uh, by tuning our system well, we were able to uh, achieve high fraction of wire speed, so it's doable. One other thing is that when, so we actually had to download about a petabyte from NERSC. And we had to do it in 20 terabyte chunks because of buffering problems, buffer issues, so there was never enough buffer on either side. So if one could actually start thinking about a protocol where we can also kind of schedule and just-in-time transfer of, of, say, petabyte scale data that, okay, transfer 20 terabytes every day, but I don't have to do it again hand by hand, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.